We're looking this afternoon at a very basic question involved in interpretation of Scripture, namely how we understand the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, and in particular, of course, this endlessly discussed chapter or question of what about those six days, understanding Genesis 1. What kind of days, we all know that six days that the chapter says God made the world, what kind of days is this chapter talking about? Is it something literal, as in 24-hour days, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, is it those kinds of days? Many believe that it is. Others will suggest, well, no, we need somehow to account for the apparent age of the cosmos, which is, uh, from what science can tell us, many billions of years old, so we have to somehow factor that in, and there, therefore there are scholars that will tell us that the six days need to be understood as what we're, is called the day-age view. The days correspond to long geological stretches of time. There's then a third option. Uh, we'll call it the figurative view, in a sense not un unlike or not entirely unlike uh, Christ's parables, a story told to make a theological statement. Now, all three of these have been proposed and advocated and debated in the history of the interpretation of the six days in Genesis 1. We're not going to try to establish a conclusion in these next few minutes. This is just a taster of what it means to engage with the question and point the way to further study and reflection and reading. So, before we jump into the days, we just want to note there are some related issues here. One would be how we relate the book of Genesis, uh, the first chapter especially, to the findings of science. Does one of these trump the other, like a trump card in a card game? Does one of them automatically, ipso facto, automatically uh, overrule the other? Or is there some way that the scriptures and science mesh and mutually reinforce one another? Those are related issues. So back to the question of the six days. Ways people have understood of the six days, we want to look at three. One is the literal view. This view of the six days takes the account in Genesis 1 as an historical record, not unlike what you'd read in a history book, not unlike what we'd read in the newspaper if the paper uh, said the week in review, the last six days, what's going on in current events. Genesis 1, according to this view, is doing something not unlike that. Proponents of this literal days view will note that each of the days are described as the first day, the second day, the third day, and so forth. Also, there's those descriptive details, and there was evening, and there was morning. <clears throat> So for proponents of the literal day view, these uh, textual uh, features are hints that we're meant to read the six days as actual 24-hour solar days. Also, this view will teach that the first chapter of Genesis is very much in sync with the entire rest of the book of Genesis. Most interpreters of Genesis uh, agree that it has to do with historical events, real people, things that really happened. There really was an Abraham. There really was an Isaac. There really was a Jacob. Uh, Joseph really did go down uh, into Egypt. He was exiled into Egypt. Now, the sixth day, the sixth literal day view will teach that the first chapter is just like the other 49 chapters, 49 chapters of real events and real people, ditto on chapter 1. This view, finally, will unapologetically place Revelation, 
over research. If we're convinced that the divine and human authors intended this to be uh, read literally, we take it, therefore, as a revelation from God. And anything that is a revelation from God is automatically set above uh, the tentative results of human research, scientific research. That's the literal view. Well, there's another one on the market. We could call it the day age view. This will teach that the kind of time we're looking at in these six days is, is not actually a rigorously, woodenly literal six 24-hour days, six solar days. Rather, the six days represent vast uh, ages of time. It's geological time, the time that it takes, as we see in the photo, for sedimentary rock to develop. Not hundreds of years or thousands or even millions, but in many cases, billions of years. According to the day-age interpretation of the six days, the days represent vast stretches of geological time, and those vast stretches are spoken of in everyday terms like days. The view will teach that it was given to people in that day in ways that they would understand. It uses everyday jargon, everyday terms to describe something vast, almost incomprehensible to the mind of man in everyday language. Another feature of the day-age view is that science and scripture mesh. Although within the day-age school of thought there are different ways that this is seen to work, all day-age proponents say that if we rightly understand scripture and rightly understand science, they interlock, they mesh. There is no final conflict, to use the words of Francis Schaeffer, no final conflict. And finally, one further feature of this view is that they'll teach that there is no problem with the earth being many, many, many millions or even billions of years old. Uh, many in this view will t unapologetically take what they will call the old earth creation view as distinct from young earth, which usually is associated with this, the literal days uh, uh, approach. Day age has no problem at all with an old creation, an old earth, even in the time frame of billions of years. That's the day age view. They will teach that uh, science is a gift of God and we need to receive it as such and study the world around us as God's good created work and we're not obliged to believe that it necessarily happened in just six days. The day age view. A third view and the third one, the final one we'll look at today, we will call the figurative view. The figurative view of, of the six days will say that the six-day account is distinct within the book of Genesis. The rest of the book of Genesis, according to most who will take the figurative view, the rest of the book is indeed historical. Many Will to, who take this view will say, yes, there really was an Adam and Eve. Yes, there really was a Garden of Eden. There really was a Noah and the flood and so forth. Because when we get to chapter 2, verse 4 of Genesis, there's a gear shift in the telling of the story. And it, the, the, the text itself moves into something much more literally and rigorously historical. But the first chapter from chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, up to 2, verse 3, is, in terms of genre and style of writing, is set apart, it's distinct. In fact, according to the figurative view, chapter 1 is less like the rest of Genesis than it is similar to a passage, for example, like Proverbs chapter 8, part of the wisdom literature. And that chapter uses richly poetic figurative language to describe how wisdom acted 
as God's partner. Wisdom is personified there. Like, wisdom is like a person rejoicing with God as God made the world. It's very poetic, very richly figurative, um, not pr purporting to present hist a historical transcription of actual literal events, but a picture of God as the wise creator. That's Proverbs 8. And proponents of the figurative view will say that chapter 1 is closer in style of writing, it's closer in what we call genre, to Proverbs 8 than it is to the rest of the book of Genesis. Therefore, in this view, we need to recognize that chapter 1 is distinct. It has its own unique role in the book. It's like a prologue to the real history that begins in chapter 2. It is not in itself real history. It's a setup to real history, a prologue. It's less an account, in fact, than it is a picture, a theological picture. And the picture is saying this, that God is the source of form and fullness and rest. The first three days, God establishes form, the waters above, the waters below, uh, day and night, the land and the sea. There's the form that God gives to his world. And then he fills it. He puts the heavenly bodies in the heavens. He puts fish in the sea and birds in the air, animals on the land. That's the fullness. And then when he's done, he gives himself a day off, showing that he's effortlessly in control of his world and he mandates that rest for his people. So from God comes form, structure, from God comes fullness, the abundance and variety of creation, and from God comes rest, introducing the Sabbath. Some thoughts to guide us. As we've said, we're not going to try and resolve this in this brief introduction today. We do want to point, however, to some guiding thoughts in how to engage with this question and indeed how to engage with Scripture as a whole. Here's some things to note. Scripture itself says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I remember one of my uh, seminary lecturers used to say, we won't understand God's word unless we stand under it. Understand, stand under. You have to do one to do the other. And if I'm not willing to stand under the word of God in its authority and in its power, in its unchangeableness, if I don't stand under it and put my will under God, I won't understand it. Interesting to note that the same person that wrote that, that proverb about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom was a scientist. And we're referring, of course, to King Solomon. Solomon wrote most of the book of Proverbs. And if we have a peek we won't look at it now, but I'll refer you to it. First Kings chapter 4, verse 33. King Solomon was a scientist. You go look yourself, First Kings 4, verse 33. He studied different breeds of animals and species of animals. He cataloged them for a man of his age, for a man of his day. Uh, he was very advanced in terms of learning to do research and, and study a study of the physical world. If he were alive today, people would call him a scientist. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We also need to recognize that the Bible, totally inspired by God, every word in it is inspired by God, and in that inspired word we're told that God does speak now one way and now another. That is wise Elihu, the ambiguous, mysterious person that's never introduced in the beginning of the book of Job and never spoken, spoken of at the very end. He just shows up in the middle and then departs. But what he says is very wise and very good. And this is what he says, for God does speak now one way, now another. In other words, God doesn't always opt to speak to us in exactly the same way. He can speak figuratively, he can speak literally, it's up to him. Here is an interesting example of God speaking about the same event in two very different ways and doing so in the same chapter of the Bible. 
If you go and have a look in 2 Samuel 12, the first few verses, the first four verses, 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 to 4, are about the prophet Nathan coming to King David. And he says, O king, I want to tell you something and ask you what you think. There were two men, they were neighbors. One was very wealthy. He had vast flocks of sheep. His neighbor was very poor and only had one, one sheep. One day the rich man had company come for dinner and he sent over to the poor man's house and he took away the poor man's single sheep to feed to his own guests. Your Majesty, King David, what uh, do you think about that? And when David hears this, he flies into a rage, we're told, and he says, that man must die. And then in one of the more dramatic, courageous moments in the Old Testament, Nathan says, your majesty, you are the man. And he's confronting David with what David has just done in sinning with another man's wife, Bathsheba. The rest of the chapter, beginning at verse 5, goes on, and Nathan recounts to King David exactly what he, Nathan, knows David has done. Nathan knows it because God has told him. And he goes back and he reports by a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, he reports back to David what David has done. So in chapter, or pardon me, verses 5 to 15, Nathan reports literally on David's sin. But in the first four, first four verses, He's using, Nathan is using very figurative language, different ways of telling about the same incidents, the same events, and squeezed together side by side into the very same chapter. An example of the truth of what wise Elihu said, God does speak, first one way, then another. Here's a question to take away in conclusion. Why did God give us scripture. One reason is this, according to Paul in the book of Romans, as a source of encouragement and hope. For everything that was written in the past, the six day account, the book of Psalms, everything that Paul knew as the scriptures, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us Christians in the new covenant so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God's ultimate motive in giving us the six days account, even though we might struggle to precisely interpret it, his motive in giving it to us is to give us hope. That's why he gave us the whole Bible. Another parallel reason why God gave, why God gave us scripture is that he might turn us toward worship. Three of the most densely packed chapters in all of Scripture speak to any Bible school student are Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. There are entire big, fat, heavy volumes written trying to understand what Paul's teaching in those three wonderful but challenging chapters. Very densely packed. You have to really follow Paul carefully and think closely and slowly to even get through it. All about Israel, predestination, the Gentiles, what is God's great plan? When Paul brings it into land at the end of chapter 11, it's surprising what he says. Because he doesn't say, he doesn't come out with one final theological point about Israel. He goes way above that. He says this, chapter 11, verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him, God, be the glory forever. However we might interpret those three densely packed chapters, Paul's goal in giving them to us is that we might join him and burst into worship just like he does in 1136. From him, through him, to him are all things. To God be the glory. That's a hint of that we're interpreting scripture rightly because it'll make us want to worship God. In conclusion, for now, a tentative conclusion, the six days, one thing that's 
beyond dispute is there are godly and scholarly people who take each of the three views that we've talked about, literal, day age, and figurative. We need to come at the question with both integrity and faith. We need to ask God to help us to be persuadable. Bible school students and even worse, Bible school teachers like myself often tend to be very opinionated. Well, opinionated people need to ask the Lord that for him to keep them persuadable. Let's all ask God to do just that. Might we be persuadable people? Let's remember that the goal of all scripture is to bring us to a place of worship. Might we agree with the person that said when it comes to those six days, it's less about how than it is about wow. Wow, God made all that. Isn't God amazing? Let's worship him. Thanks for listening.